All right. Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, my name is Kate. I'm with Writer Access, and I'm just going to give you a really quick introduction and then hand uh, over to the speakers. Um, this webinar is Living the Remote Dream with uh, Byron White at Writer Access and Darren Murph, um, author, uh, blogger, uh, great speaker. We're happy to have you both here. Uh, just a Thanks. quick Good housekeeping note. Um, this webinar is being recorded. Um, you can look for an email from Byron with the recording and slides this afternoon. We've got about 15 minutes for Q&A at the end, which is awesome. So you can submit your questions throughout uh, using the control box, and I'll be keeping track of those. And we will go through all of your questions at the end. And you can also join us on Twitter, um, hashtag living remote. You can screenshot your favorite slides or uh, share some quotes. Uh, you can also use um, our Twitter handles for the speakers, which you can see here. So Byron White, he's author, speaker, radio show host. He's he's actually quite impressive. Uh, he's a founder here, Writer Access. Um, I'll let him say hello. Welcome, everybody. Uh, first of all, it's great to have Kate on board. Um, Kate will be taking over our event management and marketing um, efforts here at Writer Access and also Content Marketing Conference. Um, we stole her away from WordStream, and she was working with Larry Kim, who many of you may know, um, who is a speaker at Content Marketing Conference and an amazing guy. Um, and uh, we're, we're super excited to have her on board. Um, and I'm happy to be talking about the dream once again <laughs> with Darren. Uh, Darren, it's great to have you. <laughs> It's great to have you here today. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Where, where Darren uh, and I uh, conducted a, a, an interview over on Life Tips, a, a radio show that I've been hosting for like almost 10 years now, strangely enough. Um, we're approaching the 300 podcast mark over at Life Tips. Uh, some of you uh, that are listening in that are regulars may, may not know that, but you can go to lifetips.com and click on podcast and actually hear the interview uh, that's now up and live over at Life Tips um, that I recorded a few weeks ago with Darren. Um, and it's funny, Darren is, I believe, the first guest that I've had from Life Tips over to the Writer Access webinar series. Uh, so hats off to, to Darren for really, um, you know, giving a, a great, uh, offering a great interview up for the Life Tips fans. I was so impressed. I thought his his uh, his insights would really bode well for the for the Writer Access community, both of customers that many of which work remotely and have challenges with managing projects and time, and also writers. Of course, probably 99% of our writers are at least working remotely when they're completing work. So. So um, I just wanted to, you know, to really give this brief introduction to Darren. It's his content that's, that you're here to read today, not, not my thoughts on it. But, um, but I'm going to have some, some groovy uh, questions for, for Darren at the end of his presentation. Uh, so without further ado, Darren, over to you, and welcome to the Writer Access community. Thank you so much, Brian. I really appreciate that. I appreciate that introduction. Uh, I'll, I'll do my best to live up to it. Uh, happy to be a pioneer uh, over on the webinar side. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to tell everybody here a bit about my background uh, in the intro to my slides. So I guess we're about ready to begin. Yep, I'm going to hand over the controls to you, Darren, and you can um, share your screen and jump right in. And I uh, also want to let you guys know I'm going to put that uh, that Life Tips uh, URL in so you can check out that podcast. It's in your chat box right there. So you can uh, get the full interview there. And uh, without further ado, Darren, take it away. Cool. Thanks so much. Uh, again, everybody, thank you so, so very much for taking time out of your day uh, to tune into this webinar. Uh, it's much appreciated. I know uh, just how valuable an hour is uh, in the life of a writer. Uh, I've, I've been there for a very long time, so I get it, and uh, I appreciate it, and I hope uh, that everybody finds this useful and applicable uh, in some way. So, start with some background. Who is this guy? Why am I listening to him? Uh, and uh, what does he know uh, about anything? So, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my story. Uh, I, I spent almost eight years at Engadget. And so, I came on to Engadget when it was a tiny, tiny tech publication. We only had about five or six people. This was in 06. And really, the blogging uh, career, as it were, had, had just begun. And so, I got in really early. 
I just had a feeling that there was something there. I was making almost nothing, but I loved the content. I loved the subject matter, uh, and I loved the reaction from readers, uh, readers that were taking part. And it uh, most certainly trumped the, the cubicle day job that I was going into every day, working on spreadsheets day after day after day. Uh, it, was a, it was a lot more exciting than that. And so uh, I stuck it out. I wrote a lot in my nights and weekends, and eventually – yeah, it became. I came to a point where I said, you know, I'm just going to try to do this full time and, and freelance full time for a while, and then eventually became a full time uh, staff member at Engadget, eventually becoming managing editor. And along that road, uh, I actually netted a Guinness World Record as the uh, planet's most prolific professional blogger. So what that is is, it's a fancy way of saying I was really determined about writing. Um, it, it, uh, over the course of four years, I wrote uh, over 17,000 articles for Engadget, uh, and it breaks down to an article every two hours uh, for 365 days a year for four straight years. Um, it's, yeah, it's, it's difficult for me to even comprehend that now. I'm pretty sure I couldn't do it again, and uh, I don't know if I'd recommend it. But I uh, say all of that to say that if you find something you really love and you find content that's uh, appealing to you and you're passionate about, uh, you really can make a difference and, and uh, hone your writing skills to get better and better and faster and faster. And uh, that's a lot of what um, this webinar is about today. So Living the Remote Dream. So this is uh, it's actually based around a book that I just put out uh, on Amazon. It's a, there's a Kindle version and a hard copy version. And... The reason I wrote this book uh, was during my time at Engadget, uh, I was frantically writing and trying to manage staff and train staff and, and vet stories. I really didn't have time to, to write a book, or I didn't want to make time to write a book. But along that path, a lot of people asked me, hey, man, could you put in book form some of the tips and tricks that you've used to be quicker and more productive and more focused and things like that? And so I, I was hearing this along the way and sort of mentally putting it in the back of my head. And. Once uh, I left Engadget in the fall of 13, I said, well, it's sort of now or never. I finally have something of a lull in my life. I'm going to start putting together some ideas on how to, to put this into book form. And I also wanted to encapsulate some of the, the craziness that went on during uh, those eight years at Engadget because what the writing world, uh, as it applies to the Internet, really changed a lot. When I started writing, the original iPhone didn't even exist. Uh, and so, uh, obviously, things have, have transformed quite significantly since then. And so the book itself is, is a part autobiography. Anybody that's worked in, in writing or remote working uh, would probably be able to relate to some of the stories that, that I've lived through and uh, some of the crazy hours you have to pull to get things done for clients. Uh, and then it's a port how-to guide on pivoting to a remote career. I've met a lot of people that have, have seen what I've done, and they think, man, why am, I, why am I doing this daily commute every day? There's got to be a better way. Perhaps there's a career that is uh, open to working remotely, uh, and I would like it. And so obviously not every uh, role and career is open for remote work. I mean, Manufacturing is a good example. That's probably not uh, ever going to go remote, but maybe there is something. And a lot of people are looking for good, good reasons to uh, enhance their career, but also find more time for family and soul searching and things like that. And so that's what I, I put the book together for, and that's uh, what I'm going to touch on today. So Byron asked me to highlight some of the tips and tricks I had and pull those from the book in this webinar. And so that's what I'm going to do here for the first couple of slides. And really, the, it all starts with adapting the home office. And so if you're coming from a cubicle environment, which is very structured, uh, there's usually doors involved or some semblance of privacy. There's, there's some sort of structure involved in that. That doesn't really exist in the home office. Uh, and if your office changes from day to day, maybe it's an airport one day, maybe it's the middle seat in aisle 36 another day, maybe it's your home another day, maybe it's a coffee shop another day. These things can change a lot. And uh, it's actually quite a challenge for remote workers. A lot of people think, oh, these folks have it easy. They can just work anywhere. But the truth is when you work anywhere, there's a lot of things that are in constant flux. Uh, and so... What I found really useful is to create house rules and establish hours exactly like a typical office setup. Um, the good example is when, when I'm home and I'm in my quote-unquote office, it doesn't have to look like an office. Maybe it's 
Uh, maybe it's a, a nook in the kitchen or your bedroom or what have you. But if it's your dedicated home office, it's it's good to set up rules and boundaries with your family and friends that when you're in that space, you're actually at work. It's not like you're in a place where you can goof off or break away from work or what have you. It's a distraction-free zone, uh, and the folks that live with you or around you need to really be in tune with that. Uh, if not, you'll get overran with distractions, uh, and it'll it'll quickly get out of hand. And I, I know a few people that, um, for whatever reason, they just can't establish that at home. It just never seems to work. It's always breaking down. And uh, I really recommend, if you're in that situation, consider a co-working space. Uh, there there are tons of co-working spaces in in almost every major city in America. And these are just amazing places to go because you get some sort of structure, some semblance of privacy. But in addition to that, everybody that shows up to a co-working space is kind of in the same boat. And most of these people are freelancing to some degree, looking for different projects, looking to meet people with good leads. And if you're also one of those people, it ends up being a fantastic networking space. You can meet a lot of people of the same mind and a lot of people that are looking for work and have leads on work. Uh, that you can't exactly find uh, at home just scrolling through LinkedIn. So uh, even if your home office seems to be working out okay, definitely consider a co-working space if you're looking to expand your portfolio. Peace and quiet. Uh, this is this is more important than a lot of people uh, give credit to. There's a couple of scientific studies that I love and I mentioned in the book that prove that long interrupted, long uninterrupted periods of time are absolutely critical for maximum productivity. Uh, if you can set, a, set aside a four hour block, let's say from, uh, from eight to noon every day, that's uh, completely distraction free, you close your email, you close your notifications, you're just gonna plow through work. It is truly amazing what can happen. Uh, and the reason why it's so amazing is that our culture has become one that invites distractions, we invite notifications. Uh, when we have an app saying, hey, can I send you push notifications, our default is to hit yes instead of no. And uh, over time, those things have crept in to create this sort of uh, just gauntlet of distractions. And so one, uh, one thing that I recommend is to do email and things like notifications in batches. So maybe every three hours you have a notification come up and says, okay, you can do email for 15 or 20 minutes and then you go back to work. And then at the end of the day, you do a large batch to take care of everything else. Now, obviously, this doesn't work for everybody, but if you look for areas in your workflow where you can push things aside so that you do it in, in chunks and batches instead of five minutes here and then five minutes there, uh, I think you'll you'll be a lot better off. Um, cut the chit-chat. This is a good way of saying uh, don't let uh, easy distractions seep in. So if you've got a few minutes here and there, it's pretty it's pretty easy to hop on Twitter or Facebook and kill those minutes. But uh, the chit chat can actually um, can can be a detriment over the course of a day and a week and a year. That that adds up. And one thing that I loved is uh, when I was working at Engadget is to put myself in the hot seat all the time. And so this pressure cooker mentality is is sort of a challenge to yourself that. Every day when you get up to work, put yourself in a position where the deadline is actually sooner than it really is. And this is more of a mind game than anything else. Uh, but I tend to, to work better under pressure. If I think that uh, the heat is on and I have to have something done by a certain time, uh, you, you let everything else fall to the wayside and whatever it takes to get the task at hand done is top priority. And if you do that from task to task and project to project, uh, you'll save 30 minutes here, an hour here. Over the course of a year, it really adds up, uh, and it can get you more projects, and it looks good on the other end. When you when you deliver anything to a client that's ahead of time and high quality, uh, it puts you in the upper echelon in terms of deliverables. There was a chapter in my book titled Focus and Productivity, and uh, the reason I, I dedicated an entire chapter to it is it, it just matters so very much uh, in terms of taking on more projects and doing more than you think you're capable of and increasing revenue, especially in the life of a freelancer. It, it's usually pretty simple. If you can take on more work, you can make more money. Uh, and there aren't but so many ways to take on more work uh, without farming things out to your friends. Uh, and and I, I really leaned on topics that I was passionate about. So when I'm looking for a job, try to find something that you're interested in, something that you're familiar with, something that you're 
you have a passion of, about and you feel like you're an expert in because you're going to be excited to work on those projects and you're going to be uh, just, you're going to plow through them. It's not like you're going to dread them or waste time thinking about how do you approach them. It's going to feel natural and anything that feels natural will get done more quickly. And on the other side of that, be willing to learn new passions. So the example I have here is uh, when I was at Engadget, there, there came a time where we decided we're going to cover science topics. So we had largely been a consumer electronics publication. And then we said, well, our readers are, are interested in knowing how science impacts the technologies that they're using every day. And I remember getting assigned this article about uh, some incredibly difficult to pronounce chemical that was being experimented on to make batteries last longer and uh, less likely to explode. There was quite a, many, uh, quite a few years where laptop batteries and portable media player batteries were overheating and exploding. And I remember looking at that article and thinking, I, I know absolutely nothing about the scientific makeup in this chemical. Uh, I have no idea how this actually applies to real life. And this is going to take at least an hour or two just of research before I can start working on distilling this down for our readership. So there's a couple of ways you can look at something like that. You can dread it. You can put it off. You can try to find something else. You can waste time not doing what you're eventually going to have to do. Or... You can see it as a challenge, jump on it immediately, and don't waste any time diving into it and learning something new. And that's what I did, and, and sure enough, it didn't take long before I was sort of the go-to science guy on the team, because people knew, oh yeah, Darren will take these science articles uh, without any lips, so we'll, we'll give him these science articles. And if you're working on a freelance basis, being given a story uh, is sort of uh, the icing on the cake. You don't have to pitch the story, not have to wait for it to get approved, it comes to you. And so things like this, when you're willing to do and learn what others aren't, uh, it usually works out pretty good for you. Daily improvement goals, this is, this is such a cliche type of thing. You know, make goals for yourself, set small goals, baby steps, things like that. But it truly, truly makes a difference, uh, especially in the freelance world. The savings of five minutes or ten minutes or an improvement of finishing an article 5% faster than you were able to a month before those small gains over the course of a career are absolutely huge. And most people don't really do a great job of setting improvement goals. They sort of take it as it comes and whatever happens, happens. And so if you put yourself in the shoes of someone that is going to set goals, uh, you're, you're automatically going to be in the upper echelon of, of writers and it will show to clients. Uh, it's, it makes a difference. Uh, there's an old, old saying that uh, something like 80% is just showing up, and this sort of applies to this. 80% of, of being in the, the, the upper echelon is just looking for small improvement goals. You don't have to make vast sweeping changes. Uh, just small goals, uh, step by step, it really does add up. Streamlining is, a, is another major topic. Um, life is crazy, and it's really, really easy to let clutter and small things add up and, and before you know it you've committed to so many small things that it's really hard to just focus on everyday projects and work that you're passionate about and so what I what I recommend is to try to zero out your to-do list on a daily basis and this is obviously easier said than done some projects take a lot longer than others uh, but I have a to-do list that's just a 24-hour list and then one that's uh, for a weekly or monthly type project list. And that 24-hour list is the one I focus on the most. If I have to go to bed and there's something still on my 24-hour list, it really bothers me. And if you get to the point where you are that person, you won't have too many evenings where you go to bed with something on that list. It just eats at you, and, and you've just got to figure out a way to get it done. And again, this goes back to just almost playing mind games with yourself and putting the pressure on yourself, even if it isn't actually pressure in reality. Uh, because you always want to be ahead of that to-do list, because trust me, life is going to throw you some things that you want anticipating being on that to-do list. So uh, the cleaner it is, the easier it is to deal with uh, left field, uh, balls coming out of left field. Uh, commit to only what you can achieve. This, this For me, when I was at Engadget, I, I wore a lot of hats, and I took on a lot of things. And uh, near the end of my stint there, Burnout was definitely a factor. Uh, I had tried to train too many people at once while maintaining a, a good clip on putting content up and managing 
a lot of different processes and uh, sleep and fitness and health and all of that started to fall to the wayside. And with that, productivity gains are actually lost. Uh, and so it is, it is good to take on more as a challenge, but it's also good to pace yourself and not burn yourself out because it, uh, it takes a while to recover from that kind of burnout. I love the, the statement, if you aren't playing, you're working. And this, if you keep this mindset, it will really keep you focused. If you wake up and you say, okay, I have eight hours to work today, well, maybe you get through all of it in seven hours and then you're playing. So if you're not working, you're playing. If you aren't playing, you're working. And if you keep that mentality, it, it gives good motivation to get through things without playing around. The little things, uh, the, the little things that make all the difference. The devil's in the details and all of those other cliches, they're absolutely spot on. If you make minor time savings, minor gains in efficiency and productivity over the course of a year or a career, it's going to make a huge difference. Uh, things like keyboard shortcuts are, are such an incredibly nerdy thing to learn about, but they save tons of time over the course of a workday. If you work in Photoshop or any of the Adobe products, there are infographics out there that have every keyboard shortcut possible in one image. And they're amazing to just print out and keep nearby. And when you learn those and you map your mind to those, you'll, you'll save a lot of time from clicking around and, and things like that. And the same goes for a lot of CMSs and, and other word processing systems. Keyword shortcuts is just a great example of something that seems so incredibly minor. You'll only save a second here or two seconds there, uh, but they add up. At least for me, they add up. Leverage apps and software to make your life easier. There's an incredible application for the Mac called Alfred, and it's basically the spotlight function, but uh, on steroids. It, it looks into everything in your system, and just a quick keyboard toggle will allow you to search for something, and you can pull up emails and documents and dates and old calendar appointments and anything you need to jog your memory and pull something up quickly. It essentially acts as an extension of your brain, and instead of having to dig through something and sort through something and waste minutes and hours looking for old items, apps and software can do a lot of that thinking for you. Uh, and so there's, there are plenty of websites out there that recommend great productivity software. Uh, if you haven't dove into that, I would definitely recommend it. it a lot of uh, those apps are worth it, and it's worth the investment in time uh, to look into those. Read other great writing. I'm assuming that uh, the folks that in this webinar are, are writers, and if you're a writer, you're also a reader. And I think one of the things that helped me the most at Engadget was I was forced to read all of my rival sites, so Gizmodo and The Verge and TechCrunch and all of that. I read them on a daily basis religiously, and I invested a lot of time in reading. And over the course of many years, you figure out who are, who are great writers and writers that, that you're passionate about, and they create content that you love. And if you sink time into reading that, and you really start to, to soak in some of the things that they do that you like, and you can apply that to your own writing. And even if it's as simple as, reading the free dictionary's word of the day. Uh, it sounds incredibly minor, but I can't tell you how many words over the course of eight years you pick up and add to your vocabulary to make your writing stronger. The, uh, the first day or two might not make that much of a difference, but at the end of the year, if you've learned over 300 new words and how to use them, uh, it makes a difference and it stands out. And something uh, like expanding your vocabulary as a writer uh, definitely makes a difference when you're competing with hundreds and thousands of other writers uh, trying to get the same project. Another chapter in my book is entitled Nonlinear Workday, and uh, this is this is probably my favorite chapter in the book, just because uh, it, it's it's the ultimate luxury, I think, when you're working remotely, uh, that you aren't stricken uh, to a, a nine to five, uh, the actual hours on the clock. Uh, when you think about it, those hours, those numbers, they they're really meaningless. I mean, a nine to five in Eastern time is not nine to five in London or or Asia or anywhere else, and, and a lot of this is just structure that's been put in place by society to make things operate more smoothly. But if you don't have to be confined by that, uh, life gets a lot more interesting. Um, there, and, and in the book, I, I make mention of a specific day where I get up at 5 or uh, 6 a.m. and I plow through a few hours of work. And then once it's properly daylight, I'll, I'll go out and take a hike or, or go skiing or go see your friends and family. Do something that's great to do in daylight hours, which most people don't have the luxury of doing because they spend most of their daylight hours locked in a cubicle. And then later that evening, you can come back and plow through work. While most people are out trying to enjoy the few hours that they do have, 
you can come back refreshed and revived and ready to go. And so this is this is like almost like flipping the workday or inverting the workday. But uh, I find it I find it great. Um, being able to get outside while there is daylight is, is a great luxury. And if you're able to work remotely and you're able to set your own hours, definitely take advantage of it. Uh, if nothing else, I think it really uh, makes a difference in how refreshed your soul is. A lot of people, especially when daylight savings time uh, isn't kicked in, you know, they'll get off work at 6 o'clock and it's already dark. And if you ask people and they're honest with you, it really bums them out. And so having the ability to not do that, uh, you should definitely take advantage of it. I do spend one chapter in the book talking about some tools that I use. A lot of a lot of what I talk about is making small gains and focusing productivity and setting up your workflow to be the most efficient possible. But it's true that what you have in terms of hardware does make a difference. Uh, I, I definitely advise people to spend spend money on good, fast hardware. Um, if, if your computer can't keep up with your brain, then that's the bottleneck. Uh, and so the, the best computer you can buy, uh, I know that sounds really simple, but yeah, it makes a big difference. I remember the first time I bought a laptop that had a solid state drive over a hard drive. It was, it was just night and day difference. Unbelievable speed improvement, you know, total game changer. So things like that, having, having access to good equipment definitely helps. Mobile data connection is huge. Most, most mobile plans these days uh, will support tethering. So if you have a smartphone with a data plan, that can act as a portable hotspot. But uh, I actually have a Verizon hotspot that does nothing but that, and the battery will last almost all day. And uh, if you're a remote worker and you're a writer, um, you can't file without an internet connection. And so having one on you at all times and being able to take advantage of that uh, is a big deal, especially if you're working in a place like a coffee shop where maybe the, the Wi-Fi is intermittent. Having your own uh, as a backup connection is a big deal. And one thing I really recommend is to over-organize and label. Uh, what I use is Google Drive, so I keep all of my old documents from bills to old client projects and everything in between on Google Drive, and everything is labeled, everything's in a folder, everything's tagged, and uh, I, I know uh, just hearing that come out of my mouth sounds like an incredibly daunting task, but the truth is if you start today, uh, it's not that hard. These things aren't really hard to do in real time. They're just really difficult to go back in time and relabel and resort and refile. Uh, so if you don't have time for that, totally understandable, but starting today with keeping things organized makes tools like Alfred that much more useful. If you, if you put in the labels now, they're easy to find later. And uh, again, over the course of a year and a career, it makes a big difference. So Byron also asked me to talk about marketing yourself, because one of the challenges when you work remotely and you don't have a face-to-face -face connection with some of the clients you're working with is standing out or even seeming like a human instead of a number or a robot. Uh, it, I've spent my entire career uh, based in North Carolina, uh, and even though Engadget was co-headquartered in New York and San Francisco, I would only go to those offices once a month or so. And so you, you have to really... Uh, put yourself out there uh, and strive to be communicative if you want to seem like an actual person that, that has an actual relationship with colleagues and coworkers. Um, this is another thing that gets overlooked by people that say, oh, you know, remote workers, they had it made, but you actually have to put in a lot more effort than the typical office dweller uh, when it comes to just building relationships and, and keeping yourself marketable. Uh, LinkedIn is the new resume. It has been for a very long time. Uh, almost no one will hire a freelancer without looking at their LinkedIn page. Uh, and so like it or not, it's a big deal. And it, it needs to be concise and it needs to be thorough. And you do need to invest time in making sure that your key projects are listed there. Uh, a great headshot goes a long way. Uh, again, like it or not, first impressions really matter. Uh, and photos do a good job of just conveying how professional or serious you are. Uh, and so a selfie is easy to take, but uh, a selfie probably isn't going to get you a, a major job with a major client. And so even something as simple as finding a studio nearby or someone that does professional headshots can dramatically improve your marketability. I, I look at LinkedIn uh, three to four times a day, either on my phone or, or on the website. Mostly because once you connect with a lot of people, you can, you basically see a steady stream of, 
uh, either job opportunities or people have changed jobs or people are looking for this freelance person or a recruiter is looking for this. And if you aren't there and you aren't looking at it, you're going to miss it. It works a lot like Twitter in that way where if you aren't looking at the stream, uh, you're going to miss out. Uh, and so I would recommend connecting with trusted recruiters, um, ask around, look at look at uh, recommendations. And a lot of recruiters are on Facebook, and a lot of them want freelance workers to come on uh, and, and handle projects here and there. And uh, it's actually an amazing tool. Before LinkedIn, finding these jobs was an incredible chore, and now the entire world is at your fingertips if you're able to connect with people. Uh, and so LinkedIn is like a digital co-working space, and if LinkedIn isn't working out, that's why I recommended going to a co-working space and start some of those relationships face-to-face. -face. The last uh, suggestion here, start with why, not what or how. If you actually Google that line, it will bring up a TED Talk from a few years ago that is one of the best I've ever seen that effectively says the best marketing starts with why and not knowing people what something can do or how something can do it. And the, the case study is Apple. Apple usually starts with why they have decided to build a product. When they introduced the Apple Watch, they started with why we felt like we should build it, not how many megabytes of RAM is in it or what it can help you do. They wanted you to know why the people inside the company did a certain thing. Uh, and that seems really subtle, but it's, it makes a huge difference. If you meet somebody for the first time and you tell them why you're passionate about something or why you do what you do, it makes a much bigger impression than if you say, hey, this is what I do or this is how I do things. Nothing without soul. Uh, so this, is, this goes back to using your daylight hours for something other than just work all the time. Uh, I have definitely found that creativity is best found outside of the office. Uh, I'll, I'll have projects that have complicated deadlines and complicated structures that I've got to figure out, and more often than not, if I go take a long walk with my dog, answers will come there versus staring at my keyboard uh, and slamming my face into my desk. That, that usually doesn't work out too well. Uh, and it's amazing in society that's not really encouraged. You know, in an office setting, what will happen is you'll get 47 people together in what's called a brainstorm, and you suck an hour and a half away from everybody. We just all sort of sit there and try to um, siphon off ideas from everybody else in the room. And in some cases, that works okay. But you know, getting outside, finding a place to to clear your head, it really does wonders for we're solving complicated projects and coming up with fresh ideas, especially when it comes to uh, new story ideas to pitch or new approaches to current projects. Uh, and investing in your health is, is a major, a major thing that I recommend, and it's, it's a lot easier for remote workers to do this than office dwellers. If you go into an office every day, you're probably not going to have access to your own refrigerator and an oven. So what you're left with is spending a lot of money on healthy food or eating unhealthy food. And again, over the course of a year or a career, something like that makes a major difference. And so being able to cook for yourself, invest in fitness, work out at home, uh, small things, but they, they really change the course of the day. And if you focus on those types of things, uh, you start to realize just how lucky remote workers have it because it's difficult for office dwellers to, uh, to sneak out for the gym or, or go back home and cook. Work to live, yet another cliche, but it's one that I actually uh, am really passionate about. Uh, if you put the time in now, you, you crank through a lot of work now, you get a lot of freedom later. Uh, at Engadget, uh, there would be some really intense months, especially in January with the Consumer Electronics Show, where everybody on the staff knew we were going to be working more hours than uh, we, we should, really, uh, that, and we would, we would lose a little bit of our sanity. But... If you plow through projects and you, you over-deliver, uh, it does buy you some time. Uh, it, it gives you a little bit of breathing room on the back side of it. And what I found best for me is to, is to grab something maybe a little bigger and bite off a little more than I can chew and then just plow through it. And then you get one or two days on the back side of that if you're a freelancer where you can just take a breather and you can afford to, to blow off some steam. Um, I, I definitely don't recommend foregoing sleep rest or recharging whenever possible, uh, definitely on a macro scale. If it happens a couple of times a week, that's, that's all right. Sometimes you have huge projects and you've got to do what you've got to do. But uh, again, like I said, it can definitely lead to burnout. And that's, uh, as a freelancer, it's not a place where you want to be. Creativity is so critical 
uh, that if you don't have enough sleep or rest, those amazing ideas aren't likely to come up. The bucket list. So how about a little bit of fun here? Um, the bucket list has, uh, you know, they've made a movie about the bucket list, and people reference the bucket list like it's some uh, crazy ideological type of thing. But really, what's what's stopping you from creating a bucket list immediately after this webinar? And you can probably think of 10 things you really want to do or places you really want to go or charities you really want to help. Uh, and in five minutes, you can have this list started. Um, it, there's a lot of people talk about a bucket list. It's, it's something they're going to do when they're retired or later or now is not the right time. You know what I found? There's just never a great time to, to travel or create a bucket list or do things other than what is necessary day to day to make ends meet. So you just have to do it. You just have to force it into life. Uh, and it's amazing how well it works if you do that. If you say, look, I'm going to establish this list. I'm going to make some goals for myself. Uh, you really have no choice but to figure out a way to accomplish them. Uh, and it's amazing what you can do. Uh, humans are incredibly adaptable. And if you put these pressures and goals on yourself, uh, you'd be surprised what comes out of that. And so my wife and I have a bucket list we have uh, since, since we were married, and we've been knocking things off, and we seem to add, add two or three more for every one that we knock off. But honestly, that's, that's how a bucket list should work, right? Uh, when, you, when you look back at it, it's, it's great that it keeps growing because every place you go or everything you do, it inspires you to want to do something else. And, um, you know, that keeps the good times rolling. So if you haven't started a bucket list, as crazy as it sounds, you should start one uh, and then look at it on a weekly basis and ask yourself if you're moving towards it. It, it works as pretty good motivation. You choose what matters. Uh, this is, uh, in a freelance world, when you're taking orders from clients, a lot of times you, you feel like you don't really have any choice in the matter. Uh, your counsel may go uh, in one ear and out the other and things like that, but there are some ways to, to take control of the situation, and uh, any chance you get to do that I think is really powerful, and it, uh, it keeps you going. A positive attitude is, is so essential. Waking up every day, excited about the work you're going to do, even if you aren't actually excited about it. It helps you learn new passions, and it helps broaden your horizons, and it, it keeps you from, from being stagnant. Uh, and by doing more than what, what's required, maybe turning in a project two days early, or uh, just going above and beyond in any small way, it makes a huge difference. Uh, it, good help is really hard to find, and good creatives are actually really hard to find, and good writing is really hard to find. And if you put in more effort in your craft than the average bear, it will definitely, definitely show. Reliability is so, so critical. It, <laughs> it's a lot rarer than you would think um, to, to say, yeah, I'm going to turn this project in two days early uh, and the next one and the next one and the next one and actually do it. Mostly because life gets so crazy that sometimes there are things you, that, that throw a wrench in, in the works and, and mess you up. But if you keep your to-do list and do it out daily, you have more flexibility in dealing with those things and maintaining good reliability. It, uh, it goes a long way. A lot of times when I hear back from clients on projects, the one thing that sticks with them after the project is done is whether or not you are reliable and whether or not you delivered on time and up to their expectations. Remote transition. So I'm, I'm assuming most of the people on this call uh, have already made the remote transition or are working remotely. Uh, but if you have a full-time job and you're also supplementing uh, remote work on the side, there's a, a couple of uh, chapters in the book that focus on transitioning from an office job to a remote situation. Uh, and it actually is possible. And a lot of times people will take jobs in an office and they'll immediately assume, I'm locked into this office forever. Uh, but at, while I was working for Engadget, uh, in the early years, I was freelancing for Engadget, but I had a full-time job at a telecom company uh, where I had to go in on a daily basis and, uh, and mess with spreadsheets all day. It wasn't the most enthralling job, but it, it did the trick for the time. But after a few months there, I started to think, you know, all I do every day here is show up, turn this computer on, and work on spreadsheets. And in theory, I can do this from anywhere. We're a telecom company, and we understand the Internet. So once I had built up a decent rapport with my manager, uh, I was able to bring this up to him and say, hey, a couple of days a week, would you mind if I do my job from home? I'm, I'm happy to put in even an extra hour because I spend at least an hour commuting so, you know, it's kind of a win-win. You get an extra hour out of me. I get to work from a place I'm comfortable. Let's see how it goes. 
And so that's how it started. Yeah, sure. Take Fridays, work from home. We'll see how it goes. And if you take Fridays, work from home, and just completely blow everything off, managers will notice, and uh, it won't work out too well for you. But if you take that opportunity to get out of the office chit-chat, don't play office politics, just focus on work, you'll actually over-deliver on Friday while everybody in the office is under-delivering. And so that can work uh, to your favor, and now we have Thursday and Friday off, or Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday to work from home and things like that. Uh, so there's a, there's an entire chapter in there. If that's you, uh, I, I hope that some of that proves useful. And um, you don't have to accept the status quo. A lot of jobs can be done remotely. Uh, it just takes the right person and the right attitude and the right willingness to stay focused, even when you're outside of the office and no one is looking over you except for you. So with that, uh, I will uh, present you with a background of Byron Bay in Australia uh, as a tip to the hat of our wonderful host. And uh, if you guys have any questions or Byron, you have any questions, I am all ears. We'd love to hear them. Fantastic presentation. Really, really great stuff. Um, I have a, quite a few questions, and then we'll let Kate chime in with some of the questions that hopefully people have been uh, chiming in with and asking. Um, uh, first of all, I loved so many parts of the presentation. Love the, the pressure cooker tip, particularly, um, you know, putting yourself on the hot seat, uh, great concept and great idea. Um, I, you know, have, have done that over the years, almost oddly like a superstition or something like if i don't get this done today then uh, you know i will get in a car accident on the way home <laughs> so um, oh, don't, yeah, absolutely. don't pay attention to my bizarre nature there but um i was wondering when, when you set those deadlines for yourself do you do you sort of put consequences on yourself that if you don't finish it and and what might those conscious uh, um, uh, consequences be yeah, I, I do. Um, a great example of this was I didn't know that there was a time where I was traveling to press events and conferences uh, on a very regular basis. And I had a, a routine 35 minute cab ride from my home to the airport. And uh, 35 minutes is, is not a ton of time, but in, but in some ways it's a lot of time. And so what I told myself was, okay, every time I have this ride back, back or forward from the airport, I'm going to, I'm going to crank out one Engadget post. Uh, and so if you, if you say you have 60 of those trips a year, uh, 60 trips times whatever you're getting paid for one article, that's, that's pretty hefty. And so if I took that and I said, all right, this, this chunk of change is going to be my play money or my savings money. You can make it whatever you want. And if you don't do that at the end of the year, if you're maintaining a budget and you don't have that to invest in whatever it is that you want. And so I, and it worked as great motivation for me. Whenever I got in the cab and I was like, I really don't feel like writing right now. It's like, well, that thing that I really want, that thing that I'm really working towards, that goal that I'm working towards won't be accomplished if I don't knock these off one by one by one. It worked. It worked for me. And, you know, everybody has something different that they're working towards. Maybe, maybe their child really wants something and they want to be able to save up and get something for them. So a lot of this will definitely come back uh, to, to money, but it doesn't necessarily have to. The other, down, the other uh, consequence, I would say, is that if you really take your daily to-do to -do list seriously, and that is one of the things on it, uh, it will just eat at you because you never want to see something from Tuesday show up again on Wednesday because what you'll see happen is life just sort of snowballs. And if you leave something there longer than it should be, you'll get hit with something on Wednesday. And honestly, back to the superstition point, you might think, gosh, if I would have just knocked that out yesterday, this thing on Wednesday probably wouldn't have happened. And like fate is telling me to get on top of it so I don't continue to snowball whatever these lists are. Uh, so again, it, it comes back to mental games, uh, but the pressure cooker works so, so well for me. It was probably the thing that, that helped me increase productivity and focus the most uh, because most people hate pressure and they will do anything to avoid putting themselves in a deadline situation. And so if you go against that grain and you make everything a top priority and everything a pressure situation, inevitably you're going to get through things faster because you want to get out from under that self-imposed pressure as fast as possible. Great answer. Here's a question about your uh, create house rules. Working from home can be lonely. 
particularly if you're working all the time from home without much interaction with people. As a result of this, do you think you become more interested in social media and, and even human you know, connection? You know, do you find yourself talking to the FedEx person for like 20, 30 minutes because you're, you're lonely? Or do you find yourself scouting Facebook more frequently? And is that a distraction that you need to, you know, be cognizant of as you, particularly as you transition from the cube to, to the remote setting? Sure. Yeah, it can it can definitely be lonely. Uh, this is my if you are in that situation where loneliness is actually a detriment to you getting work done, my first recommendation would be seek out a co-working space. That's exactly what those were designed for. It's to bring creative minds that don't want to work alone into a place where they don't have to work alone. But once you're in there, if you need four or five hours of privacy, everyone will respect that. But you're around real human beings that are of a like mind. And most of these are very minimal costs because it's a shared cost across hundreds of people that, that use the space. But if a co-working space is too far away or you're too remote or too rural to, to get into that, yeah, absolutely. Social is the next best thing. I mean, these are, these are real friends and real connections on Facebook and LinkedIn and Twitter. And it's, it's to your benefit to interact with these people and maintain a relationship with them exactly as if you were seeing them on a daily basis. You know, look at what they're up to. Let's see if they've changed jobs. See what projects they're working on. Catch up with them. The trick is to not let it become your whole day. So make sure it's not chit-chat. Make sure it's actually relationship building. And this is another thing that I recommend doing in batches. Uh, it, it's not really healthy to check in on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter every five minutes between projects or between paragraphs. That's a great way to break your concentration and break your flow. But every couple of hours, if you just need a mental break from whatever you're working on, that's a great time to batch that type of activity. Uh, and it works pretty well. And definitely keep in touch with people on, on those mediums. It goes a long way for relationship building and for eventual networking. Even if you don't need another project right now, you never know. Um, life is crazy and it doesn't hurt uh, to know as many people as possible. Those are some great answers, Dan, and great questions, Byron. Um, I've, if you're still there, and we can't uh, hear you at this oh, time. Oh, um, so yep, yep. Um, okay. I'll just one more question. I know that Kate's got some questions, but I've got just just one, one yep. or two more. I'm going to sneak in, and I'm sorry, I had my mute button pressed just out of my uh, protocol. Um, but my, my my other question was: do, do you need a sense of inner accountability to be successful remotely? And wouldn't you acknowledge that some people are just less accountable than others, or more accountable, as the case may be? Um, and would you worry about people that are not driven by this sense of accountability uh, working remotely, and just say, "Okay, fine, you can start working." from home now would you be worried about that and would you need to send them into a boot camp, boot camp of accountability before they attempt working from home you know i think it's like everything a total case by case basis there are undoubtedly cases where if you let certain people roam free and, and work remotely they will take advantage of the situation they will exploit it they will blow off work they'll blow off projects and do whatever they want but the truth is I found that these things regulate themselves pretty quickly and pretty fairly. Uh, if you enable an employee to work from home uh, and suddenly none of their projects get, get done, one of two things are going to happen. You'll either bring them back into an office setting, uh, suggest that they go to a co-working space, or you'd part ways with them. It, it's pretty easy to tell early on whether or not it's going to work. And I think the biggest sign is if you let someone work remotely and their productivity goes up, that is the person most suited to work remotely because they have that innate sense of accountability. They put themselves in the pressure cooker every day. They don't need someone watching over them. They are their own watchdog. And most of this comes from the motivation of the faster I get this done and the higher quality that I'm able to produce, the more free time I'm able to buy myself. And it's almost like a daily transaction where that is the reason why you push yourself further because you want more time for yourself. So in some ways, it's an extremely selfish transaction, but it's a win-win because the person doing the work gets more time to spend with their family or a charity or whatever it may be, and the person on the client side gets, gets work that's timely, reliable. Uh, it, it works both ways. And so 
you do need a, you definitely need an innate sense of uh, accountability. If you're the type of person that really only functions well when you're being micromanaged, it's going to be tough to, to transition remotely unless you are able to get a manager that even on a remote basis is highly communicative over IM or phone or Skype or whatever that may be. Loved your my last question, then over to you, Kate. Um, I loved your slide, nothing without soul. By the way, I'd love to see a picture of your dog in there, as you mentioned. Uh, oh, perhaps yeah. <laughs> I think that would be a great background as you to tie that in. But my question is actually a conflict uh, that I want you to address. And you know, you you actually talk a lot about this this notion of sort of playing and working at the same time, and taking a break, and going for a hike, or going for a walk, and then maybe kaboom, the the, the problem, the solution of the problem will hit you. Um, but but do you think that we should be cognizant of what's going on there in, in that we're missing the continental divide, which I think you think is healthy, which is separating work from, from play. And I, I worry that people work from remotely or, or might become thinking about work all the time, you know, and because they can't separate the drive, the, the physical element of going to the office where they're going to get in the work mode. And then of course the drive home where you enter your site, your street and you say, ah, oh, okay, I'm done with all of that. Can you talk about, uh, you know, that, that, that distinction and, and how you should handle that? Yeah, sure. I've actually learned this the hard way uh, because honestly, for remote workers, the default is to just let work and life completely overlap. And there really is a, a dissolution of work-life balance. And, and in the book, I actually mentioned an example of there were many years where I would go to family gatherings at the holidays or what have you. And I would be there in the flesh, but mentally I was not there at all. I was completely absorbed with projects coming in on my smartphone or texts or notifications or whatever it may be because I didn't have to leave and go to an office for that work to continue coming to me. And so the default is, yeah, it can completely consume your life and, and over time it leads to burnout and it's not really healthy. But strangely enough, you mentioned that commuting to a job and then away from a job sort of acts as that transition period for a normal office dweller where if they're in that commute period, they know that they can start mentally shutting down and, and transitioning back into um, the, the person outside of work. I think for remote workers, it can work exactly the opposite. Uh, if you wake up and you walk three feet to your computer and you start working, that's that you are completely in work mode. But if you look up at a certain hour and you say, okay, I need a mental break, and you commute out to a hiking trail or you walk out to wherever you're going to begin uh, walking your dog, you actually physically move and commute to an activity that is not work, that is the mental break. And then when you come back, obviously, it switches back. The only difficulty there is uh, inside the home, it's really subtle. Maybe there's a home office and a kitchen that are literally five steps from each other. How do you make sure the work doesn't come from the home office to the kitchen? Uh, that just really boils down to having a strong family uh, structure and encouragement around that. When, when you step out, everybody knows you're out, and when you're in, everybody respects that privacy. Uh, and if it, if it ever gets treated as the same, it's going to be difficult to separate them. So it, it comes down to the person making the choice that when you step away, we're outside of it. And it's it's definitely easier said than done. I have missed many, many family gatherings being mentally absorbed in work. Uh, you just have to make the choice to not do that. Otherwise, it'll happen. Kate, over to you. Thanks so much, Darren. Awesome. So I have a ton of questions. We'll do like a rapid fire for you. Um, you mentioned your dog. I'm looking at him online. Gangster, is that his name? What kind of dog is he? <laughs> that is uh, my, my dog's name, Gangster. He is a uh, half French bulldog and uh, half Boston Terrier. And so uh, the, 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 the gangster thing really came together when uh, I visited Taiwan. And apparently in Taiwan, uh, dressing up your dog is like, it's like a major thing. They have entire yeah. clothing stores just for dogs. So I got this tie that really looks like a, sort of an Al Capone tie uh, when I was visiting and came back and put it on. And my, my wife got an amazing picture of him almost. It, it looks like he's growling. He wasn't growling. But the way his look was uh, positioned in the picture, it was just perfect. And so... Yeah, he's our little gangster. He'll he'll lick you to death if uh, if he sees you. He's, he wouldn't hurt a fly, but you know, the the name. You, should, you should put that yeah. picture on Twitter. That sounds hilarious. Yeah, I will see. definitely do that. Yeah, I, I love showing him off. He's a good guy. 
Uh, so you mentioned apps for saving time. Can you tell us uh, some of those apps that we could use? Yes. So Alfred is an amazing, like Alfred is an Alfred Hitchcock. Look that app up. That's probably the most powerful app. Uh, that I that I can recommend in terms of just finding things on your network drive or your computer. Uh, it is truly incredible what it can pick up and how fast it can pick up. And it's great for referencing old projects and digging up things that you forgot about five, six years ago. So Alfred is an amazing one. Uh, another one is Clip Menu. Uh, this is there's a there's an alternate version for Windows. I'm sure uh, this is a, it's a Mac application. But effectively, what it does is everything that you copy and paste from snippets of text to full images to HTML code, anything you copy and paste, it maintains in, a, in, a, in an archive. And uh, it maintains something insane like the last thousand things you copy and pasted. And as a writer, I cannot tell you how many times Clip Menu has saved me uh, from lost text or word crashes or system reboots or things like that. So having Clip Menu, it literally copies everything you copy and paste, and uh, it has saved me many, many hours of redoing work. Uh, that's that's a big one. Uh, I could I could go on and on. I will say, you should look up a, a site called Todoist. Um, there's a, a gentleman named Taylor Martin who does uh, a weekly podcast on really great productivity apps. Uh, again, his name is Taylor Martin. If you look him up on YouTube, you'll see uh, his channel. And I would definitely recommend uh, recommend subscribing to that because he surfaces apps all the time that you've never heard of that really do help your productivity. With was that Todoist, T-O-D-O-I-S-T? Yep, that's right. All right, I'm putting these in the chat um, box for everybody to look up later. Um, so one of the questions that comes up with our uh, freelance writers, they're spending a lot of time collecting assignments on the computer. Um, so how could you do that and, and still get a lot out of your day, still be productive um, in that time that you're you know, collecting, waiting for assignments? Yeah, it's, uh, it's one of those things that gets easier with time. Uh, for, for people just breaking in, you'll spend the majority of your time uh, doing administrative tasks like that, like looking for assignments, trying to find projects, and, and, and then actually doing the projects is the minority of your time. But what happened in my case was the more projects I took on, uh, the more references that I was able to get. And eventually, the, the tide starts to shift and projects will start coming to you if your quality of work is superior or above average. Uh, because people talk, and if they find somebody that does a great job on something, they'll keep coming back to that well. Um, repeat business is a major, major benefit, and the, the longer you're in any career, uh, the more repeat business starts to become a, a real part of your life. And so, uh, up front, initially, it's tough. It, that is definitely what you spend the most time doing. But if you tackle projects and do them well and outperform and, and you actually try to connect with these clients on LinkedIn and build a relationship, then whenever something comes to mind, you'll be the person they go to. Uh, and that's when you start seeing absolute maximum productivity gains when stories begin to come to you. Cool. Um, I just want to say it's 2 o'clock now, so some of our attendees, uh, if you need to head out, that's fine. Um, Darren, do you have time for a couple more questions, or do you have to head sure. out? Sure. Awesome. No, no, Great. go for it. Um, uh, one question is, how do you manage a team that works remotely? Um, a, a few people are asking this. Yeah, that is, uh, it is no easy task. I, I managed Engadget, uh, like I said, from North Carolina, and um, I have to say, we, we managed a team using a pretty old school uh, chat room, a virtual chat room, and uh, you guys now have it a lot easier thanks to an incredible company called Slack. And they're, they make a chat tool that is just phenomenal for maintaining communications and maintaining relationships with remote teams uh, it is truly a remarkable tool. And so if you're in a position where you have to, to manage a group of virtual uh, people that work in different areas, definitely get everybody on Slack. It's just amazing because it will archive, like if you're, you're managing a 24-hour shift, which is what happened at Engadget, we would have situations where our our team in, in Japan would be, would be talking in, in a chat room and then all of that knowledge would be lost for the next shift because there was no archive of that. 
So if you're using a tool where there's an archive and they can scan back through and see what the highlights were, that helps bring the entire team to one place on a continual basis. Uh, what it really requires, though, is someone that is passionate about working remotely and isn't afraid to be highly communicative. And I don't say that to say be a micromanager. Uh, but you, you have to be able to respond to things in a way as if people were standing in front of you with the same request. I would get, I would get emails constantly about, uh, my, my payment didn't come through, or do you think I'd be able to apply for this open position, and things like that. If someone were standing directly in front of you in an office, that would be instantly a top priority, and you would go above and beyond to try to address that person's concerns. So mentally, you have to take an email with the same level of sincerity. You have to be able to, to drop everything, be quick to respond, and treat people as if they're right there in front of you. And it's, it's a lot of work. Uh, it, it's usually a lot more time consuming to type something back or make a phone call versus handling it in person. But that's a good way to keep a remote team engaged. And finally, the final thing I'll say on that is make sure you hire correctly. There are, there are some people, as Byron mentioned, that remote working just – just isn't really cut out for them. Maybe they can't focus well or they, they just need the, the oversight. That's not who you want on your team. But, I, but when you have the entire world at your fingertips in terms of resumes and location doesn't matter, finding people that are passionate about it, that are able to self-regulate, those are the people you want on your team. And it's usually pretty obvious within the first few weeks if you're going back and forth on Slack whether or not somebody is truly engaged with the team and can voice their opinion and their personality over a really cold medium like I am or text message. Awesome. Great answer. And I put that website in the chat for you guys as well. Um, another offshoot from that question is um, some of our attendees, you know, they've been working remote for years, um, find that there's an expectation from others in that traditional office to be immediately responsive. Um, or, you know, if you're not immediately responsive, it's kind of assumed, well, maybe you're not really working. So how do you uh, combat this without being on email or IM all day long? Yeah, um, this is a, an incredibly good question, uh, and a lot of it boils down to company culture. Uh, as crazy as that sounds, there are some companies where they're frenetic and they're high-paced and they want everybody in the office instantly responsive, and so if you move remotely, they're going to still have that same expectation. And truthfully, at Engadget, when we were working and we were handling our shifts, we to some degree expected that of everyone. But when it wasn't their shift, we understood that it wasn't their shift, and we knew if we asked them a question, it was going to be a while before they got back to it. So much of this comes down to laying the groundwork before you make the remote transition. Uh, I currently work with a public relations firm that, for the most part, does not uh, allow people to work remotely, or at least they don't hire remotely. Most of their people are in offices. They do have people that work remote, but they're definitely the minority. And so what I did is before I ever started on day one is I had a heart-to-heart a -heart with my manager, and we laid out what the boundaries would be, what the acceptable time limits and response time would be, uh, and what methods of communication in terms of tier one importance, two, three, four, how does this work? And that's, that sounds really granular, but if you don't set those expectations up with your manager and your colleague, people will undoubtedly end up on different pages, and it's just not great for the relationship because one person will assume that this is an acceptable, uh, acceptable amount of time. Another will assume something different. And if that is misaligned for too long, you end up in a really poor working situation. So definitely put in the effort to, to compromise and talk about what is acceptable for both parties. Great advice. Um, this is a quick question. I know Byron can chime in. Uh, what job sites are available for remote workers or remote riders? Yeah, Byron, do you want to, uh, to start that one? Rider access. That's my only answer. <laughs> uh, I figured as much. No, no, really, rider access is amazing. Um, there's, it's it's really amazing that. My my talk recommendation is feel really feel free to talk about now. feel free to talk about any of your favorites. There there are awesome sites out there. Um, yeah, there are bigger, awesome. broader, I mean, Elance, yeah. Odesk, and you know, uh, scripted, yeah. contently, uh, you know, Skyward. I mean, there's tons of writing sites out there that are yeah. free for everybody to apply to. You know, have at it. Yeah. Um, and uh, 
you know, so, but, but your thoughts would be wonderfully welcome here. So have at it. Yeah. The, the list he just went down is exactly the one that I would go down. And the only thing I would add to that is, is communicating with real people, uh, be it at a co-working space or on LinkedIn. Uh, a lot of times you'll find recruiters that are looking for odds and ends and things that need to be done. And, and maybe some of them are a little bit outside of the wheelhouse, but it's something you'd be interested in diving into. Um, that's a, it's a, just a great place to go to get a diverse selection of what's out there. And recruiters are all over LinkedIn. Some of them are better than others, but you can usually find references pretty quickly and determine which ones are good and which ones aren't. And, and these recruiters are in the business of finding great freelance talent to fill slots very quickly. And so your, uh, your expectations align uh, pretty, pretty much straight out of the gate. They need somebody that's great and they need them fast and you need a project that you don't want to spend a lot of time looking for. Uh, and so just connecting with recruiters on LinkedIn is where I would start. Um, it, it's pretty easy to find an eclectic selection of, of work on there. And of course, not every, not every one of them will pan out, but uh, it can't hurt to, to connect with people. And, and if you land one job and you do a great job, uh, again, they'll, they'll keep coming back to that well. It's the most efficient thing for them and it's the most efficient thing for you. Awesome. And, okay, I know that you are a Guinness Book World Record holder for blogging. Is that correct? Yep, that's right. All right, so we've got someone who wants to start a blog. Um, so you've probably got great advice. Uh, where do you start? Yeah, it's, um, <laughs> I'll say, I will say it's much tougher now than it was in 2006, mostly because of the democratization of, of content. So, the internet has, has gotten to a point where it's uh, it's pretty easy to find, especially in the news world, it's pretty easy to find free news. You don't really have to go out and, and pay and get through a paywall to find really good content. Um, the, the thing I would recommend most is be specialized. Uh, that is your best bet in getting traction if you're starting something new. And, and just as an example of that, uh, obviously I'm most affiliated with technology sites. so. John Gruber has a website called Daring Fireball, and it's just a one-man show. It's a one-man blog. It's really simple, almost no pictures, uh, but he's very, very specialized. It's almost all based around Apple products, and he has almost a 20-year history of covering those products, and people trust that voice specifically for Apple. There are similar people that cover specifically for Windows or Microsoft type topics. Uh, there's a gentleman named Ben Thompson that lives in Taiwan that started his own blog, uh, Stratechery, and it's behind the paywall. But he's found enough people to pay whatever it is, $10 a month, to support him because it's just a one-man show. And so you don't need a million subscriptions if it's a one- or two-man show to support the lifestyle. Uh, there's a website called The Information. I think they have a staff of maybe 10 and they charge a pretty hefty subscription for uh, getting access to their content. But again, they don't need to sell a million subscriptions because it's only 10 or so people. So if you're looking to get into it, definitely specialize. Uh, don't, don't try to do what everybody else has done unless you're joining a team that's already successful at that. Uh, that's definitely a hard road to hug. But if you can get specialized and you're really good and really insightful in what you do, it's easier to build an audience that way. Cool, great. Last two questions, and then we'll let you go. <laughs> um, OneNote, Evernote, or a, a different app to organize work, information, to-do list. Personally, I like Evernote, but I'm interested to hear your opinion. Yeah, so I, I would agree with Evernote, and um, the reason actually says a lot more about my preference in general for workflows more than, than Evernote itself. Whenever possible, I like to to tap into things that are multi-platform. And so OneNote, yeah, it's multi-platform, but it's definitely built by Microsoft and works best on those platforms. Whereas Evernote really has no skin in the game. The, they need to work great on iOS. They need to work great on Android, Mac, PC, and so forth. And so for people that are juggling multiple computers or multiple devices, having Evernote allows the same uh, UI to transfer across everything, and no matter where they're at, they can have access to that. And so I would prefer Evernote for that reason, but this that also applies to basically everything else. I know a lot of people like to listen to music to get into the zone uh, when they're working, and this is why I prefer Spotify over something like iTunes, because Spotify will work on an Android tablet, 
uh, whereas iTunes will not. And so whenever I can find something that's multi-platform, that's usually the approach I'll take. Cool. And last but not least, do you ever hire virtual assistants to help you out? Uh, I have I have an Engadget. I mean, we I, at Engadget, I hired uh, over the course of my career there over 30 people in different capacities. Some were interns, some were assistants, wow. some were writers, uh, some were designers. Um, and, and yeah, so definitely have done in the past. Currently, I do not. Uh, anything that I've done on my own uh, freelance type uh, operations, I've, I've just done myself. But um, there are a lot of people that do, and there are a lot of uh, small consultancies that need graphic designers or, or copywriters um, that, that are looking for people that would be on this webinar. And I think just a, a final tip of a place to look, I, I work in public relations now and in marketing and comms, and so I sort of switched from one side of the fence to the other. And one thing that I'm seeing explode right now is companies want to create their own content versus relying entirely on the media to tell their stories. Uh, and that's an amazing opportunity to, to start a copywriting career with a company that's just looking to start into that fold. Uh, I, you know, blogging has been around for 10 or so years in terms of being able to make it a career, but in terms of companies telling their own stories, it's at the very forefront of that. And that's where Contently and Taboola and Outbrain, that's what they're starting to tap into. So a lot of opportunities there. Uh, a lot of companies don't even know they want that. But if you, you, if you have someone that works at a company in marketing and comms, bring it up to them. You never have. They may say, you know what, a blog would be an amazing idea for our company. Let's get something going. Great, great tips. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks, Byron, for your amazing in interview skills. Um, look, everyone that's still here, look for an email with the recording slides, and we have a free chapter of Darren's book. Thank you so much that uh, you guys will get access to, and uh, hopefully you'll want to uh, buy the rest of it. So thanks for joining us. Thank you so much, Darren. Thanks, Byron. And uh, have a great day, everybody. You bet. Take care. Thanks so much.